Well, welcome everybody. My name is Florence Hudson. I'm executive director of the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub at Columbia University in New York. And today we're super excited to have a special guest with us to present on our National Student Data Core Masterclass Series. It's January 2024, and this is episode number four of our Masterclass Series, which started at the end of 2023 when not to use machine learning. The opposite of what everyone's saying, right? You have to use machine learning. Get that generative AI working for you. So today's speaker is Matt Carbone. He's a computational scientist at Brookhaven National Laboratory, which is one of the US Department of Energy national labs in the United States. They do very cool things. They have a national synchrotron light source, a lot of cool stuff going on. Um, with us today, but kind of hidden behind her little logo, is Emily Rothenberg, and she's the program manager for the National Student Data Corps, and she directs and produces and creates all of these masterclass videos. So I really want to thank Emily for her incredible support and leadership, and I think we're going to hand it over to Matt so he can share his thoughts on when not to use machine learning. Okay, so... Um... I'm Matt Carbone. I'm, an, I'm a staff scientist at Brookhaven National Lab in the Computational Science Initiative. You can think of this as the computer science department at BNL. Um, my specialty personally is I take AI data-driven tools and I apply them to science. Um, and so today I'm going to be talking to you a lot about this from the um, perspective of how one does this in, in my field. So um, I'll get right started. Okay, so first, just a little bit of uh, contact info. Um, I'm actually only going to reference one of my papers today, but you can find that here in the uh, publications uh, section, uh, open access, and uh, code in general is on my GitHub. So shameless shameless self-promotion. So just jumping right into it, the, the topic of, of this talk is when not to use machine learning, um, but I have to kind of go into some detail into, you know, why machine learning is taking the world by storm, you know, and what is going on in the community. So this graph over here is a simple preprint uh, search uh, from the archive, which maybe some of you are familiar with. And if you just look at how many times AI shows up in the search results per year, you can tell what what kind of growth is this? Anyone from the the audience here? Any any guesses? Um, so the Y scale is logarithmic. Oh, logarithmic exponential growth. I don't know exactly. What's Exactly, exactly. So it's exponentially growing, right? I didn't actually do the math to find out how quickly the, the number of preprints doubles every year, but um, it's an exponential growth, right? So this is crazy. I mean, we haven't seen anything like this, at least to my understanding, in a very long time, if ever. Um, so it's definitely worth taking note of. And of course, you know, I'm guessing the entire audience has heard of some generative or large language or foundation model. I'm just putting a few of those examples on, on the screen here. ChatGPT probably the most popular of all of these, but Bard from uh, Google is catching up and I'm sure Meta has a bunch. Um, so some some crazy stuff is happening in the machine learning world. And so you may be thinking, I'm coming in here and saying, when not to use machine learning? This is crazy, right? Don't we wanna use machine learning for everything? Um, and the answer is no. And I'm gonna try to explain that very quickly here and, and when you can uh, confidently not use it um, in your own work. And I hope that this provides a bit more context than when you can use it because I'm very AI forward. I'm very, you know, excited for the, the, you know, what AI has to bring for us in science in the future, but we have to be measured, right? Our expectations have to be measured about where we are gonna apply it. So with that said, this is my favorite slide um, of any presentation I ever give, because I'm gonna ask the audience a question, and that is how do you know this is a cat? This happens to be my cat, Lucy. So this is for you, Florence. How do you know this is a cat? Do you have any yes. ideas? You just told me it's a cat. So that that's a very good, um, very good thing. Yes. And I know it's, a, or I think it's a cat, you know, with all this deep fake stuff that goes on now, <laughs> because it has those cute little ears. It's yep. not looking me in the eye because it doesn't want too much eye contact. Um, it has a pointy little nose. It looks very comfortable. Lucy is very happy. You take very good care of Lucy. I can tell she's very comfortable. Um, yep. And about the size, looks like she's on a couch. So she's probably not, you know, a huge thing out in a jungle somewhere um, about the size of a house cat um, and fluffy and cute. Perfect. I, I like all those answers. So I'm going to give you a few of my own. Um, I'd left out fluffy and cute, though. That's a good one. So I, I should make sure to include that the next time. But I noted there's a sort of a cat tail, a cat nose, whatever these things mean, right? Paws, pointy ears, whiskers, furry coat. Um, so all these things sort of embody the cat, right? 
Um, doesn't really matter how the cat is oriented or whatever, it's still a cat, right? But here's the problem with this. These I would call sort of heuristics, right? They're, they're sort of used, they're, they're things and features I define, right? About what makes the cat a cat. But the problem is, right? That is that, I mean, is this a cat, right? Based on our heuristics, it's got quite a few of the same descriptors as the cat does. Yeah. We know though, of course, this is not a cat. This is in fact, Loki, um, a dog that my sister has dog sit for in the past. Um, and as I said, just to reiterate the important point, that is not a cat. Um, so the real question becomes, how do we know that that is not a cat? And this may seem pointless, a pointless exercise, but it's actually not because in drilling down into exactly how it learns, how we learn, we're really drilling down to how machine learning learns, right? And so you can see the sort of title here, all AI ML models share one thing in common, which is how they learn. And that is by example, it's almost this offshoot of radical empiricism. It's this idea of data, right? data without sort of an underlying theory. And so we know these are cats and dogs because we've seen lots of pictures of cats and lots of pictures of dogs, right? And so we know there's some sort of, imp there's some sort of abstraction behind what the cat or dog is that lends itself to that definition, okay? So keep that in the back of your mind. And the reason this is important is because if you train a machine learning model, right, on pictures of cats and dogs, there's nothing in that model that's gonna tell you whether or not something is a bird. Okay, so what is AI ML? I'm gonna give a really, really quick, you know, very cursory overview, but first, what it isn't. And when you Google artificial intelligence, this is what pops up. And this is a problem because this is not machine learning, right? And it's not AI. This is closer to, I mean, based on these pictures, this is robotics, right? And I realize I have to move a little quicker, so I'm gonna go quickly. This is what we really should see, which is curve fitting, okay? So for those of you in high school or college, right, and maybe you're in an applied math major and you're like, wow, is machine learning this like special thing I can never understand? No, it's actually not. It's really just building on the bedrock foundation of your, of your math knowledge, right? It's really just fitting very, very complicated models to data. And so what you really should see when you Google artificial intelligence or machine learning is stuff like this, not these sensationalized pictures of robots, right? Because that is not what it is. And I'm going to really just hone in that, the, uh, focus in on that point here, right? This is my joking title, "The Devil's in the Distance." It's taken from my uh, my uh, the paper I'm going to I'm going to reference in this uh, presentation. But imagine you have this set of observations. You can ignore the true function in the background for now, and you want to fit a line to this data, right? So, okay, the 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 animation started sort of halfway through, but we'll give it a second to cycle. This idea of slowly changing the parameters of some model to best fit the data, you may have already done this when you've done linear regression, it may be in college, right? Um, you may have learned about gradient descent for those of you who are advanced undergrads or graduate students, right? All of these general concepts, it's exactly the same in machine learning, except the models are much more complicated, much larger. You need more sophisticated methods to train them, right? Um, and they're less interpretable, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, and to me, the, the uh, really machine learning when it comes down to it is the intersection between big data, really advanced models, right? And the mathematical tools used to train them. You really need sort of all three of these things together um, with, of course, uh, the, the, the sort of computational firepower GPUs usually uh, to do so. But it's really important that this is what machine learning is, right? At a very fundamental level. So if you understand this, you understand most of the way machine learning models are trained. So data should satisfy certain properties in order to be able to use machine learning. And I'm going to give a very simple example of one area where machine learning uh, will not save you, right? And so here's uh, another, I'll have another question for you, Florence, in a second. But you can imagine, yeah, that this red curve is the prediction of some model. It's actually the mean of a Gaussian process, for those of you who know what it is. But think of it as the mean of some model. And you can see it fits the data pretty well when it's close to the data. And it you know does a decent job when it's far away. And the question is, how do we actually know that the prediction in this region has this low error bar. That's what this shaded region is, right? How do we, how can we be confident and rely on this prediction here, even if we didn't have the error bars, right? Maybe we just had the points nearby. So we knew there were points, right? But the model is making some prediction in between them. What are the assumptions, do you think, right? That, that let us make this prediction. 
the assumption we're making here is that the data is smooth in some way, right? In other words, a small change in the input produces a small change or at least a controllably small change in the output, right? You've learned that for, again, for advanced undergrads, graduate students maybe, you've learned this in your applied math class. The same rules apply because at the end of the day, right? If it turns out my point is here, hopefully you can all see that, right? This is yes, maybe, can, yeah. you know oh, yeah. what I mean, right? And right. if, if it turns out that that's where your point is, and you have this big jump, this almost close to discontinuity in your data, there's no way that machine learning is going to be able to capture that, right? So you need some consistent idea of smoothness, right? You, you have to be able to separate out the signal from the noise, um, these kinds of things. So I have, I have another, maybe this is a bit more of a, of a you know, general idea, but so often I see models being trained in some sort of data set which I represent as this blue um, oval or whatever, right? And this is where you, this is where training data is. And usually people's testing sets are pretty well overlapped with the training data most of the time because they're doing some random split, right? So in the example of cat pictures that I, that I was talking about, let's say that you train your model on, you take, you have a hundred million cat images from households, okay? And you take 99. Oh, I forgot the number I just said. You take 99.9% .9 of those images and use them for training and you take 0.1% and use them for testing, right? And training includes cross-validation and everything, whatever, right? It's probably the case that the testing set is well representative of what you trained on. because you kind of sampled from the same distribution. And so within that window, you can expect pretty good performance, probably, right? But now imagine you wanted to take this classifier you've trained to determine if there's a cat in a picture or not or something like this. And instead of testing it on house cats, you want to test it on cats, you know, who aren't in houses, right? Cats maybe that are on the street. You have now taken a classifier trained on a specific set of data, and you're deploying it on a completely different set of data. Intuitively to us, because we've seen lots of cats in houses and lots of cats on streets, or maybe cats in movies or whatever, lots of different environments, this doesn't seem like a big deal. But to the machine learning model, it's never seen a cat on the street. So it doesn't know what to do. Right. So if you take your model, right, and you put it into an environment that it hasn't seen before, you're sort of you're sort of out of sample now, right? And you've 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 deployed your model on a data set that looks very, very different. You mm -hmm. cannot ever take the performance of that model for granted. And a classic example of this that I see in science is stimulated versus experimental data. Right. Mm -hmm. If the simulated data really looks like experiment, you're good. It should work, right? You still have to test it, but there's a chance. There's a good chance it will still work. And there's examples in the literature of this, but there's also examples, stuff I've studied a lot, right? Where if your simulated data and your experimental data look very different, even if an expert, right, can come in and say, oh yeah, that simulated spectrum and this experimental spectrum are the same. If they look different, right, in terms of a maybe distance measure, like I was talking about before, I didn't actually mention the the, the distance piece here, why I called it this, right? But if the distance between those spectra, sort of the L2 distance or something like this is very large, there's no way the machine learning model is gonna know that those are the same unless you program it with that knowledge. So very important, Trace, always make sure that you your deployment, uh, your deployment scenario is in sample, right? And if it's not in sample, there is absolutely no way you can rely on that model to work. Very important. So this is a fun slide um, about what AI ML really does. It generalizes the data they haven't seen before. So in this slide, I have this sort of information box, this data box. And you can imagine that maybe you have data in the blue regions or, or teal or whatever color that is, and you don't have data in these white regions, right? This is a very, you know, this is an abstraction, okay? I'm put the little coordinates here as maybe a guide because it literally could just be you have data on these X, Y points, right? Um, but it could be some higher dimensional space. There could be information in this somehow, right? Just think of this very abstractly. So there's holes in your knowledge. Mm -hmm. What machine learning does is it bridges those holes, right? This is one of the reasons machine learning is so exciting because in, in fields like molecular discovery, right? There's so many molecules that we may not have thought of that look like other molecules. And so machine learning can really excel in that area. But the problem is when you start to go outside of this box, and when you go outside the box, it's a non-starter, right? I'm willing to make a very bold claim and say that if you go outside of the data and information that your model was trained on, okay, your model can never be relied upon. But here's the good news. We have a mechanism, right, for 
for exploring, right, these data points? What do you think it is? What do you think it's called? Any ideas? Science. That's what okay. science does, right? Science takes a point you haven't seen before and rigorously tests it and finds the ground truth, right? And once we know that ground truth, we can add it back into our modeling paradigm, mm. and then we can expect our model to do well. So that's what science does. And in fact, there is there are sort of active learning schemes where the model kind of knows which new data to pick um, and added that to its training set um, that you know are, are very closely related to what we would call science. But nevertheless, the role of the scientist in this regard is is still incredibly pivotal. Hopefully, that's that's clear. So at the end of the day, machine learning is moving at breakneck speed. Responsible use has never been more important. And again, I want to be very clear. I'm very pro machine learning, right? But I'm even more pro responsible use of machine learning. And so I'm paraphrasing from a paper um, that I that I that I cite down below, and and Florence will recognize the name on this paper, um, right? Which is that there is currently no evidence of big data driven breakthroughs in the physical science and sciences. And I completely agree with this statement. Um, and there's, you should read the paper if you're interested in, in hearing the precise reasons why. Um, but, but most important is that everything we do right now is being framed through the lens of what big tech has done. And so big tech is not big science. Our goals, data, risk tolerance, right? Especially risk tolerance and accuracy requirements, et cetera, are all quite different. So it's very important to keep this in mind when you're taking a tool from big tech and you're trying to put it in the science world. And just to kind of give a pushback on what I just said, right? There are, however, useful tools which can accelerate science and assist scientists. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't do another shameless self-promotion. Most of this is summarized in this perspective I wrote for MRS Bulletin about a year and a half ago. Um, so if you are interested, do check it out. Finally, I would also be remiss if I didn't mention the elephant in the room, large language models, right? So you've probably heard of GPT, as I said before. Do they break the rules? Does everything I just said not apply? anymore. Um, so I'm actually exploring this idea with a few colleagues of mine, which you can see below. This is an invited uh, piece, which we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully be, be publishing soon. Um, so on one hand, these large language models can do crazy data fusion, right? They can write a poem in the style of Shakespeare that mentions, you know, the word Apple three times every sentence, you know, random fun novel stuff like that. But on the other hand, they hallucinate. They produce wildly incorrect answers to simple prompts. Why? We don't really know, right? We have some ideas, but we don't know for sure. Um, they can answer questions on hugely broad arrays of topics easily, right? They can serve almost as really sophisticated search, uh, search engines, but they can't perform basic reasoning tasks, right? Mm -hmm. Such as simple mathematics. And my favorite, they can produce pretty accurate code using simple prompts. This is probably a very popular use of GPT, but be very careful because it has the tendency to produce working code that is totally wrong, right? And I experienced this myself when I tried to um, turn a vectorized Python program into a C++ program, uh, more or less for fun. It didn't work. So be on the lookout. Finally, I have this playful slide here where I ask ChatGPT when I should not use ChatGPT. Um, and so you can see actually that ChatGPT itself reflects a lot of what I just said. For example, don't use it with sensitive information. Don't use it in critical decision-making situations, right? Emergency situations, definitely don't, right? controversial or biased content. A model is only gonna reflect the biases of the data you train it on, right? So if you wanna have a, a result that's you know, accounting for this, don't use a model that's trained on biased data. And here's a quick hint, every model is trained on biased data, right? Um, and there's some other things here, but the, the great irony of this slide is don't actually do this, right? Um, you probably should not be asking GPT when to not use GPT. You should be using your own logic and reason um, you know, as to when to not use GPT. Anyways, um, I just give a quick uh, acknowledgement slide for the record here. A big thanks to my, uh, some of my coworkers and friends who really helped me, you know, when I was creating the content for, for this perspective, which of course led to this, um, this little masterclass, right? And then some funding, uh, big thanks to, you know, Brookhaven for, for supporting me. And at that point, the, the talk is done. I think I came in a little over time, but hopefully uh, we can talk a little more. Thank you. Great job. This was a lot of Thank fun. You. And I love when we make things interactive. And so um, there are a couple of things that struck me while you were talking about, you know, how, you know, generative AI and LLMs, how they hallucinate. So do humans. And, yeah. you know, they might be trained on biased data, 
so are humans. You know, what I usually tell people is, well, go into ChatGPT. And I did this last year and it's different now, but it's rather the same. Ask it about Silicon Valley Bank. And it goes, oh my gosh, this is Grace Bank, Silicon Valley, works with all these startups and VCs and stuff. At the time, that's, a, you know, it said, now when you go in, it says, so this data like might be a little old, <laughs> you know, and it might be a little old. So how do people know if they should trust it? I, I, I often say my new acronym is ABS, always be suspicious. You know, is the information correct? Is the analysis correct? Is the thinking correct? Has it changed? So I'm interested in what you think about all these things I just mentioned, because I was building these up in my head as you were giving all this great content. Oh, first of all, thank you for saying the content was great. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> I'll try to start from the beginning and go forward. You may have to remind me because my memory is you know, not what it used to be. ChatGPT is trained on the internet, right? It's this very, very, very broad space. And so if you imagine just fitting a curve to the internet, think abstract with me, right? You will get most answers decently correct, right? Like it's probably not going to say that, you know, Paris is in Japan. You know what I mean? So you're going to get some general stuff right. You may not be able to tell you about every single you know, thing to do in Paris necessarily, right? Or, or you know, the modern trends in Paris or, or something. I don't know, right? But it will tell you general things. But when you drill down into a very specific point in that space, you need to get a lot of data there, right? Mm -hmm. In order to be really accurate to the, to the quality we demand in science in the published literature. And a model that's trained as a generalist is just not going to have that type of knowledge. You would have to fine tune that model or create a whole new model in that space. And this goes, I can hopefully go back on my slides. This goes all the way back to, to, to come on, to this slide, right? Where you really want your model to be trained on the data that you're using during prediction. And a lot of people feel that this is a weakness of machine learning, but I view it as a strength, right? It makes slow thing go fast for cheap. So I know I kind of segue away, away from that. So I'm happy to go to the next question now. But um, that's great. Yeah. You know, like on the on the machine learning side, you know, people based on their application and their context may think, okay, that's it. We're locking it down. And I think of some of the application areas where the data is always changing, the context is always changing, yeah. the fonts are changing, the way you yeah. look at it is changing. So is there a rule in machine learning about that's the algorithm, that's it, we lock it down and we don't touch it? as compared to, it does have to learn <laughs> based on what's changed. Right. Yeah, I think I, I, I think models generally have to change, right? As time goes on, as new data becomes available. Um, certainly in the academic world where we have a DOI on a, on a piece of data, right? On some artifact we put into Zenodo or Materials Cloud or something, that model is fixed. Um, so it's a little different in the science world where we're not really like maintaining a cloud infrastructure and streaming new data to this thing and retraining constantly so we can, you know, make the most money or, or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but to, to address your question more generally, I think we really do have to start thinking about models that can be updated continuously. Um, otherwise, models become obsolete. And speaking of, you mentioned, when can you even rely on these things? This is a hard question to answer, but to me, the only way to even have a chance of answering that is to look at the data, mm. right? You have to look at the data. And this is why GPT and these foundation models that are owned by big tech can be so weird, right? And, and um, almost arcane, almost magical, because we don't really see the data that they're trained on, right? We don't really have a good idea then of when they're going to be performant and when they're not going to be performant. And every time you query it, it produces a novelty. It's funny, it's interesting, right? But a big part of what at least my directorate is trying to do, right? And to me to some to some degree is to find a way to like go from novel, funny and interesting to truly useful, right? Exactly. How can we really leverage the power of these things to mm -hmm. accelerate science? And that I think is where we need to look, not for AI to discover new things on its own. Because as I, as I mentioned, I personally think, right? And I've feel I have enough evidence to back it up that this is a like total this is a tautology, right? AI can only be performant on the data and information it was trained on. It may discover new things within that box, but going outside, it won't work. Right. But using it as a tool to accelerate things that are otherwise slow for us, that could be revolutionary. 
You know, this has been amazing, Matt. I, I love the way you think. I love how you've shared all these different perspectives with us. Um, a lot of this, when we talk about it at the Big Data Hub, we have it under the category called responsible data science. You know, how to use data science responsibly, including security, privacy, and ethics. So you've given us so much to think about, and you've helped us really think about how scientists use it, and maybe how the leverage of this is going to change over time, just like everything gets to evolve, right? Sure. So. I really want to thank you for joining us. Maybe we'll get to do this again. We had so many cool things we talked about. We would love to collaborate with you some more. Just let us know if there's an opportunity for that. Um, and I hope that all the audience out there thought found this very interesting and intriguing. I can, I can hear or see some of you going, hmm. So I think maybe we made you think, which was one of our favorite things to do. So um, thank you from the Northeast Big Data Hub, our entire community of almost 10,000 humans around the planet, uh, the National Student Data Corps, our program manager, Emily Rothenberg, and we hope to see you on the next Masterclass series. Thanks again, Matt. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for having me.